the, 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 the title of the session uh, we're, about, we're about to hear is called Financing Options in a Bull Market. The panel is moderated by Ms. Lizzie Rowe, who's off council at Watson, Farley, Watson, Farley and Williams. And she's joined um, by the following professionals. I, and please, could you come up to the stage? Uh, Ms. Jolene Chu, co-head, origination and structuring, offshore marine and shipping at Clifford Capital. Mr. Marcus Wenker, Chief Financial Officer at FSL Trust Management. Mr. Vijay Kamath, Head of Southeast Asia, South Asia and Middle East at Transport Capital. Mr. Ali Susanto, Managing Director at Braemar Naves Corporate Finance. And Mr. Shi Lei, Senior Executive Director at FPG Asset and Investment Management. Thank you very much, everyone. Lizzie. Thank you. So it's been hard to miss the fact that 2021 was a bumper year for the shipping industry. Um, that was highlighted in the various marine money articles, but also commented on in the mainstream media. Um, mainly driven by a resurgence in the dry bulk market and also the container sector. I think one client recently described it as the container companies having their moment in the sun. And this was very much reflected by what we saw at WFW in terms of not only deal flow, but also quantum of transactions, um, where we saw not just traditional financing, but also a variety of other structures, including ABS transactions in the container sphere. And Shirley and I were both involved in an innovative ECA backed Jolco transaction led by HSBC and City for C SPAN. And the first few months of 2022 looked like we're in for another strong year. So the first question is, is finance a plenty for everyone or just for the select few? Um, Jolene, as you're sat next to me, <laughs> I'd love to hear your thoughts um, and Clifford Capital's perspective on that. Clearly took the wrong bet. I thought that I was safer sitting next to her. Uh, no, I think uh, in general, um, there's a lot of financing um, interest into the sector because um, shipping has supposedly been you know, doing extremely well. So you do see a lot of um, potential investors. Whether the true money is really coming in, that remains to be seen. Um, very selective, I would still say. We do see among the lending, the senior lending market, um, still the same old bullish uh, appetite for uh, the top tier names. And I think uh, quite a few of my partners or, or, or panelists here uh, would agree with that. Uh, in terms of how, um, how innovative uh, in terms of financing structures that we're willing to look at, I, I think that that's gone up quite a fair bit uh, in, in ever since the pandemic struck, uh, simply because um, there is the ESG angle, and ESG has been extremely new relative to, to the, you know, the really long history that shipping has enjoyed uh, over the last uh, centuries. And um, because of that, uh, many traditional lenders are now willing to explore newer asset classes like containers, for example, um, and, and willing to look at all kinds of structures, and I mean, at least that's for Clifford Capital. Uh, you know, we were set up to support Singapore companies to go international, specific to shipping. Uh, we, we are more than happy to look at whatever um, potential new project there is out there and to see how we can help internationalize uh, a shipping company that, that has enough uh, roots in Singapore. So from that perspective, we're, we're very optimistic, very positive, and we do see a lot of interest in the industry. Thanks, Julian. Um, VJ, I'm just interested on your perspective. Do you see it as it is a plenty for everyone on the financing perspective, or, or is there a sort of two or even three stream uh, lanes, depending on sector? I'm going to be track. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm going to try to be the disruptive element. There is not enough capital for shipping. Um, it's, the banks have moved towards what they call applied to quality. Um, lenders, other lenders have tried to fill in the gap, but there is a lack of capital in shipping in general. And that needs to be filled if we have to go and develop new designs, new technologies to meet EGOs, not ESG goals, because 
most of the ESG is focused on the E, not on the S and G. So um, there have to be other structures, other elements, other sources of capital that need to come in before we can say that, well, that there is enough capital for everybody. Okay. Um, Marcus, would you care to give us a perspective from the, the borrower side? Um, from a borrower's perspective, there is um, enough capital. I mean, um, over the last, I would say, five to ten years, a two-tier market has developed indeed. Uh, we have the large international banks, which focus on um, large groups, balance sheet-based lending and stuff like that, um, who also increasingly um, push the, the ESG agenda through um, with the Poseidon principles and others, and you have smaller lenders um, who have come up, and they are bank lenders who entered the market, they are alternative lenders um, which have entered the market, um, but there's a lot of finance. Um, to one, one point to what you just said, <clears throat> I wouldn't say that there isn't enough finance, and I think one of the reasons shipping is cyclical is there is generally too much liquidity which leads to over-ordering. And if we had too much financing now, and the, the uh, decarbonization of shipping will certainly cost a lot, we have heard of, of that uh, today, yesterday, um, but this will be over a very long time. If we were now fueling the market with, with money, we would basically fall into the same traps that have created all the past, uh, the past collapses of shipping markets, in my mind. But you're talking only debt. I'm saying there is not enough equity. But is there shipping capital? Is there equity available? There's not enough Chile, is this one for you to jump in on? Um, from our perspective, I think uh, we focused on Joko and uh, uh, over the past year we also uh, uh, established a, a capacity and track record under the uh, Chinese lease and the Japanese sale lease back structure. Although uh, we represented the equity party, but from a lot of the equity we arrange is, is more uh, semi-subordinated uh, uh, that, but at least we do take paper uh, risk in terms of uh, uh, subordinated, uh, as a subordinated lender. But from that perspective, I think uh, over the past two years, uh, after the initial shock uh, of COVID, I think the Japanese uh, uh, market, at least on the tax investors uh, under Joko, that market remained uh, uh, resilient. And uh, although we are not back to pre-COVID level at all, but the market demand is really strong. We are trying to stay uh, prudent, uh, try not to carry it away uh, by the strong demand in terms of the uh, project selection. So I think now from our perspective is um, uh, we are focusing on uh, uh, looking at the right projects and the right client in terms of uh, uh, quality and, uh, and assets. But in terms of uh, when, when there is a suitable project, but we feel comfortable there are sufficient uh, uh, capital to support that. And uh, based on our recent uh, experiences for uh, Chinese and Japanese um, uh, sale and leaseback structures, I think as long as there are suitable clients, suitable structure uh, with, with a project that makes sense, I think there are at least uh, uh, quite a, uh, a number of options from both the Chinese and Japanese market to support such financing. Yeah. Um, and Ali, did you have anything to add? Yes. Um, I would say that there are pockets of liquidity for, I would say, even all sectors and all tiers of capital. It depends on the project and depends on how you structure it or how you link these capital providers with the companies that need it, right? So, f for example, um, last year we closed five Japanese lists, which basically provide level 80 to even 100%. So, you might argue that whether it's junior debt or, or equity on the level above 70%, right? Um, and also, we just closed one also offshore deal. We basically are yeah, basically buying the debt, and yeah, you can argue again. They do not leverage up, whether that is debt or equity. So if I look at the deals that we are looking at at the moment, uh, we are actively looking at eight mandates at the moment. Three are basically in the offshore oil and gas, basically restructuring, raising debt and equity for the buyer, or, or yeah, the new incoming buyer. 
And actually, two dealers are newcomers into the dry bulk sector. Uh, previously, never owned ships before. Now they're coming to, to, to the shipping industry. We help them to raise money. And I was surprised, actually, with the response that we get from the market. Uh, this is basically their requirement. is non-recourse, newcomers. Uh, we got three term seats. Three term seats each for, for the two clients. Whether you like the terms or not, that is a yeah, different issue, right? Um, but at least that is sufficient uh, interest or liquidity to look at this project. Um, so the, yeah, for, for me, the issue is more where you, you speak to or who, who you speak to, which pocket or liquidity we are talking about. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I just want to circle back because um, a couple of you mentioned the ESG impact on the financing. Um, and I'm just curious what the panel thinks that if there is more finance generally available in the market, does this mean that there's going to be less capacity for financing older and secondhand vessels? Or might we flip the other way and suddenly with the amount of competition that actually people start to look past their ESG um, requirements and their standards just drop generally and it's a free-for-all. Um, I think, VJ, you'd mentioned um, sort of your, your comments on the ESG side, so I'll start with you. I mean, there's, there's finance available for, for all sorts of ships in this market. I mean, Ali just gave you an example of new entrants coming into the market and, and finance being available. Um, I don't think so. It, creates uh, working now ah, okay that's <laughs> you mean you were hearing me without this before <laughs> uh, yeah as I was saying I mean it would create a, a sectoral or a, or a tiered market in uh, to, so to speak where some lenders focus on the on the e element and focus largely on on the newer vessels whereas some lenders, will focus on, on the older vessels because the returns are better. Um, there are play players who would stay with pure equity. For example, today a container ship owner can afford a, a smaller, older ship without having to, to borrow because that's m that much money is in, in that business right now. So there's, there's opportunities there. Um, there's capital available for each tier of that market. Uh, but as I said, it's only focused on the E, not on the S and G. Okay. And um, Marcus, I think when we spoke the other day, you had a sort of quite strong opinion that, that it was still possible to go ahead with the secondhand financing. Do you want to share some more on that? Yeah, I mean, um, we did finance um, a fleet of vessels last year, refinance a fleet of vessels last year with an average age of 15 years. And the oldest vessel in that package was 17 years old. We didn't have any problems um, finding uh, finding someone to finance. And obviously, we did have um, charters attached, so there was cash flow, and the lender was very comfortable with that. Another point there is also that age is always relative. Um, when you have when you're in a segment where the average age is relatively high, even a 10 years old vessel may look relatively young. Um, at the same time, there are obviously some banks who have very clearly stated that they are not financing vessels older than a certain age anymore, which is perfectly fine. And where some of the smaller other players um, come into, into this scene and offer that financing, filling the gap. And um, Jolene, where's uh, Clifford Capital's stance on this? Are you somewhere in the middle or leaning one way or the other? I think for us, can you? Yeah, no, for us, um, we do believe that the transition is a transition, so that's going to take a long time. I think that was one of the common themes today across the various panels. Um, and with that in mind, it also means that we do see a need to continue the financing for vessels, secondhand vessels that are not necessarily uh, green. 
they they obviously should be greener. There should be some kind of um, a focus or an intention by the company to be held, um, you know, strictly to certain standards, obviously, um, for transition by the company and for opportunities like that. Um, we we are very much open to to looking at such transactions and also bearing in mind Singapore's. Um, Singapore's goal to be a green ship finance hub. Uh, we, we have, you know, over the course of the last few months, the MPA has been uh, announcing various initiatives and, and one of it was uh, to help develop Singapore as a green ship finance hub, as well as to, you know, other things like greening the Singapore registry, for example, uh, and there are certain very concrete targets set for Singapore flagged vessels. Uh, things like that, we are taking a, a very intense, um, uh, or, well, a, a very serious look at to see how we can try to assist uh, companies or potential clients in, in, in um, transitioning their fleet. So on that basis, it doesn't mean necessarily mean that, look, I've got a five or seven year old uh, second hand uh, handy size, um, can you please finance it? And I just say no, uh, simply because it's not uh, dual fuel or more efficient or etc. It really depends on the full package, including the corporate or the sponsors who are behind the vessels. All right, that makes sense. Um, and Ali, that, that seems to tie in with, with your comments from earlier, but is that very much in line with what you've seen over the past sort of 12 to 18 months? Yes, I, I would agree to that. Um, so, for example, if you approach financiers with um, green asset working in wind farm, for example, you get response probably 80, 90 percent of the requests. People come back for more information, more inquiries. If you yeah, finance older vessel, maybe you got 10 or 20 percent response. There's, have I have said that, um, like for example, we are financing now, try to raise scrap financing for 18 years old tanker. There is still interest. Uh, so, again, back to the pocket of liquidity I mentioned earlier. So it looks like certain sectors, certain uh, age or profile of the vessel, there's always financier ready to, to do deals. Again, back to the terms whether the borrower likes it or not, there's another story. <laughs> always up for negotiation. <laughs> um, and and Shile, what's your feeling on how the Jolco market views the sort of drive towards the ESG and, and the availability of funding towards that? Um, I think it's, there's definitely an influence or push or preference even from the Japanese uh, small uh, small medium enterprises uh, in terms of uh, a contribution towards the uh, ESG angle. And we are uh, finalizing a Jogo transaction, uh, which the pricing is actually linked to a ESG score, not only E, but also SNG score. Um, I mean, this is our first transaction that is related uh, uh, to uh, ESG score of a company. But at least that is a, uh, uh, at least a trend or an effort that we're trying to make to, uh, to uh, contribute to that angle. And of course, from, um, uh, from uh, uh, FPG uh, itself as a, uh, as a listed company in Japan and also its uh, associated company, we are trying to um, also to, uh, to look uh, further into the ESG angle, ESG angle including uh, we are uh, a partial investor in a, a green shipping fund, which is set up in uh, in uh, Europe and backed by the Dutch ECA. So I think there are. Uh, I wouldn't say they. Um, how to say the uh, the older uh, assets are being squeezed out of uh, uh, from the ESG angle, but I think in the market there are definitely conscious efforts which are pushing the uh, the green and uh, ESG angle. Uh, uh, to incentivize additional capital to be provided to uh, assets and companies which, which are uh, uh, aiming towards that direction. Yeah. Um, and I think at the beginning I was talking about the press coverage in terms of the amount of financing that's been available and how the shipping industry be, has been doing well. Um, but that's, I think, largely been focused on some of the larger names in shipping. And I'm just curious what the panel think. Is there a danger that some of the smaller owners become squeezed out because of overpricing? Um, Marcus, I, I don't know if you have any specific views on that. Um, I think pricing is not really a problem because um, 10 or even 50 basis points or even 100 basis points will not make a bad project good or good project bad in my mind. 
Um, I think what will become more difficult for owners going forward, even though we are in a very fragmented market in shipping, but there's a certain, in, in all segments, there's a certain concentration um, or consolidation of charter as you see it in the container space, where in the last crisis you had 15, 20 large operators, now you are down to five, six, seven, which dominate the market. You see that in, in dry bulk, where uh, depending on the, on the vessel you are talking about, you have a very few, very large uh, mining companies or traders that are dominating the market, and you see the same in, in, in the tanker space. Um, so that is becoming, in my mind, um, or pricing is not the problem, but the, the access to the right transactions is becoming an increasing problem for smaller owners. And Ali, is that consistent with what you've been seeing as well? Um, I would say pricing is, is one thing. I think the, 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 the point or the aspect that really squeezed the newcomer coming in or SME is the terms of the financing. In the past, probably you can get 70, 75 for the small owner or a yeah, relatively small owner. But now the financier, there are all these alternative financiers who provide the loans. They are, I would say they are quite safe. Um, yeah, they would only quote 40, 50 percent loan to value, that kind of things, and a very strict governance on, let's say, cash reserve, that docking reserve. Yeah, so as an owner, you really need to think hard indeed how much money you can put in and how much money you want to put. So I think that is the key difference. Where the, the, yeah, for, for me, last time in the past, I think the banks probably has been underpriced shipping loan to the smaller owner. Uh, I would put it probably now is more suitable pricing, you consider the risk, that kind of things. Um, but the terms of, the other terms of the financing, that would be the killer, I would say. And Jolene, is that sort of consistent with your experience? No, absolutely. I think there's definitely a bias um, towards the larger operators. But I do feel that um, one, one key reason for that is as banks or as bankers, uh, you want to finance a business, you don't want to have to run a business, right? So if you are faced with the situation where you are left with some kind of an enforcement in your hands, uh, you've got a bunch of vessels, then the, the financier is faced with uh, the decision, okay, what do I do with these ships, these ships right now? Um, obviously, we, we've learned a lot since um, the, the crash starting from 2008-9 timings. So there has been a lot of, um, call it practice scenarios that we've all been through, um, you know, personally and, and as an institution. So, so um, from that perspective, it, it shouldn't be as daunting uh, as compared to before. So back then, when, when the market crashed, everybody was like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do with all these ships? Who's going to be helping me to enforce the mortgage? How am I going to arrest the vessels, etc.? And then over time, we've all learned what to do with them. And then you're, you're stuck with, with the thinking, okay, so even if I know what to do to enforce my mortgage, do I really want to do this? Do I, can I afford to hold on to the assets for a few months, a year or two? Or should I just get rid of them no matter the cost, just so that I can save time and resources for my bank? Um, so just from that thinking, or the, from that mentality, I, I do feel that naturally many banks or lenders, um, are, they are turned towards the, let's just go with the bigger ones. Uh, what, what bigger or smaller necessarily means, again, it, it's a relative um, discussion. I think since we're on the topic of relativity, Ali rightly mentioned, you know, it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, some clients, they say, I don't like the terms that you give. And then the, the thinking is more like, hey, you know, you do have a term sheet in front of you. So somebody is willing to extend X million dollars uh, to finance your vessels versus uh, or at, at a higher price, maybe twice the amount of margin that you're willing to pay, but versus a situation where, you know, you're, you're trying all means and avenues to finance your vessels, but nobody's coming to the table. So I think... Uh, Co companies have to be, fa they are faced with that dis decision and uh, they have to do with it. And Vijay, would you like to add anything to that? First of all, smaller doesn't mean worse. Um, they could be very good operators who have a, 
a limited size of fleet. Um, yes, cost of capital will change depending on how they're operated, what kind of charters or, or um, employment the vessels have. Um, secondly, um, as Ali rightly pointed out, it's in, in the mentality of the owners. Uh, the, the days of the 70, 80% for small owners is probably gone unless we don't learn our lessons. Um, so going forward, they have to be able to put more capital at risk themselves uh, or look at avenues where they can raise capital from friends and family or other, lo other um, avenues for capital. Um, what I hear from lenders uh, across the board uh, there are people who will take the risk at 50 or 60 percent uh, for small owners. There are others who will do it at a uh, higher leverage, but the cost is no longer the 4 or 5 percent. You're talking about 8, 10 percent, which is probably the return the ship owner makes. So the ship owners are the ones who have to look in internally and decide whether that cost of capital is worth the project that they are ent entailing or they, they can live without it, that's it. And Shile, any final thoughts to add to that? Um, we are dealing with a, a cyclic industry. So I think at a different stage of the cycle, uh, not only in shipping, but also in banking, I think we have uh, different situations. I think uh, before 2019, when the market uh, was struggling, then we do see that, especially also as, uh, after uh, uh, the uh, banking regulation in terms of Basel, um, we do see what uh, BJ described that uh, a flight to quality, and then the smaller uh, ship owners, we see that in the market um, they are facing bigger challenges in terms of uh, uh, seeking finance. And that is also we were uh, at one uh, at one point at the moment also looking into. Um, f uh, help them to find solutions, the smaller sh uh, ship owners to find solutions to the financing. But of course, uh, after COVID broke out, and um, strangely enough, and that uh, uh, created uh, one of the bigger uh, recoveries in the shipping market for, for a larger uh, number of sectors. And then actually through the, uh, in, during the past two years, we have seen that the, a lot of the smaller ship owners actually have with the, the, the uh, improvement of their financial performances, they actually have much better access to financing. Um, I guess at, at this moment in time, I think the smaller uh, ship owners and operators may uh, be enjoying a better time, more comfortable time, better access to, to capital as compared to probably three, four years ago. Um, and uh, let, let's see what happens uh, uh, going forward because at least until uh, end of last year, the shipping market has enjoyed uh, a phenomenal uh, market run as well as uh, 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 abundant access to liquidity. And we do see a lot of uh, new build orderings that's being placed to be delivered in the coming two or three years. And um, we all know that uh, the, the demand and the supply is not, over, uh, not always uh, uh, synchronized uh, uh, throughout the uh, points in cycle. So if for example, two, three years later, the demand doesn't really match up the, uh, the, uh, the delivery of the new built tonnage. And then we may see that the smaller uh, tonnage providers or smaller owners, operators may face a little bit more difficult uh, uh, time in terms of financing again. But at the moment, I think generally to a lot of people we talk to, uh, even the smaller owners, they, they have at least uh, some reasonable financing options. And then that also uh, um, uh, created uh, some observation that there are, are also smaller and newcomer uh, ship owners that they saw the opportunity in the market and there are capital bank, uh, backing them and that there are new entrants uh, in, the, in the market as well. Okay. And I think we touched on briefly the sort of alternative financing options and I know the panel before us was talking about MBC debt. Um, and one thing I'd love to hear the panel views on is how do the borrowers get comfortable with some of the short-term opportunistic creditors that they may see in the market? Um, Vijay, what would your advice be? Well, I mean, I think we've all said it before. You have to weigh the options available and look at a uh, medium to long-term solution rather than looking at uh, a short-term solution. If you're looking at 
I mean, from the lender's perspective, how, what's your payback? What's, how, what, what's the cash flow of the project? I think that's basically comes down to the grassroots of project. And Shile, what's your experience been on that? Um, typically from a Joko or Japanese point of view, um, people look at the long term. Uh, but of course, if there are uh, opportunistic, opportunistic financing uh, which match uh, a specific project, uh, why not? Right. But of course, for more prudent uh, owners, operators, of course, for one-off project, one-off financing, you should also match with uh, a long-term overall plan. Probably just keep the opportunist, uh, short-term op opportunistic, uh, uh, let's say, financing for a small part of the finan overall financing strategy. That is probably in shipping as a cycling industry, as I said, I mean, uh, it's important to, to have a prudent and a long-term view. And uh, Marcus, you're sat here with your borrower hat on, so what are your thoughts on how borrowers deal with opportunistic creditors? I think there are two aspects to it. First is, um, from a borrower's perspective, it's to look at the lender the same way the lender looks at the borrower, which means track record expertise of management, where does the capital come from and stuff like that. And the, the second aspect is that the, the narrative that traditional lenders are safer than those more opportunistic lenders from a borrower's perspective is not true anymore. And we have seen that after the last collapse, we have seen some banks, some of the leading banks exiting the ship finance market in a rather aggressive way. And uh, some banks, because they were in such a hurry to leave the ship finance market, have caused unnecessary pain and cost on the borrowers. And this is an important aspect there. And I mean, I'm an, I'm an ex-banker, and I have the sense bankers of large banks shouldn't be too arrogant towards the market because fortunes can change very quickly. Okay, and that, that's all very true because I think we do have this concept that it is the, uh, the alternative financiers coming in that, that tend to be more opportunistic. But like you rightly pointed out, when the traditional banks exit the market, that can have a knock-on impact as well. Um, I'm just conscious of timing and there's one last question I wanted to ask. Um, Julian, I'm going to direct this to you to start with. Um, but how do the lenders prepare for the um, bear end of the bull market? You did talk about the fact that you know, everyone's been through this cycle before, you're more comfortable, but, but what sort of measures can you take at this stage to better prepare yourself for when the eventual cycle comes around? I've been thinking about this a, a fair bit. Um, essentially, I think we have to stay true to our credit criteria. Um, we have seen markets where, you know, the market is super hot and everyone's just trying to dump in money in the past um, and saying, I need a piece of that, I need a piece of th this, etc. And, and, you know, th the competition in the past used to be so intense that certain names do get really the best conditions. Um, and doing that is potentially dangerous, especially in the bull market, because people or banks or managements, they, they tend or they could forget um, that when there's an up, it, there's also a down cycle. So in a situation like that, then what happens? Um, well, for us, uh, you know, we, we are we have the developmental mandate uh, at Clifford Capital, but at the end of the day, we are also we, we we tell ourselves that we have to stay very true to our credit cri criteria, and there is a certain set of criteria that we try to base most of our or all our transactions on. Um, and any deviation from the set of criteria would have to be really rigorously uh, defended if we were to go into something that's more in line with current bull market structures. 
um, that, that's really the, the, the key thing um, that we are having discussions on internally. Uh, so let's not just chase the up cycle and let's just also prepare for, for the down cycle. Because ultimately, we want to stay in there with the clients. Uh, we don't want to dump them when the market's going really tough because it's a relationship and, and it's a two-way relationship. The clients remember you for life and you remember the clients for life as well. So uh, we, we try to be more holistic about this, right, Marcus? <laughs> right approach. <laughs> Ali, do you have any lessons learned from previous cycles where uh, you have some advice for what the lenders can be doing? I think back to the very basic of uh, banking lending principle, right? The, the four or five C's of lending. I think you have to still stuck to, to that actually. Maybe a, a bit of food for thought is if you compare what happened, let's say how many companies defaulted or bankrupt, let's say in the FBSO sector, compared to OSV, for example. Yeah, you can draw a few lessons there also, right? In general, FBSO contracts are more solid, and the functionality of the asset is required, is solid, is there. OSV is easily to be uh, replaceable, contract is loose, there's a termination or convenience, that kind of stuff. Uh, so I think, yeah, collateral condition, character of the owner, cash flow play the big part. And Vijay, did you have anything to add just before we get timed out? I'm not the lender, but uh, in, in general, I mean, I've seen in the past that uh, historically lenders have tended to be uh, cyclical rather than counter-cyclical. And that's always been a problem except for this cycle where lenders have now tried to be more counter-cyclical as much as possible. I mean, it's difficult not to run the, with the tide, uh, but I've seen enough resistance in that space right now. The other part is obviously to follow the cash as far as possible. Make sure that you have enough cash flows to cover the, the repayment of the loans. That's about it. Good advice. Well, it'll be interesting to see how things play out over the next 12 months, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you.